every single weapon foundry in destiny oh my days a quick announcement for everybody on youtube i will be casting the next returning raid for destiny 2. i figured a lot of people want to watch raid races but don't have a place to watch them all in one so don't worry i got your back over there on twitch.tv slash evanf1997 go follow my stream and as we get closer to the day i'll announce more plans on what's happening but just know we're suiting up and we're casting all the best raid teams as they take on either King's Fall or Wrath of the Machine. Also, the C-19 got me, so if I sound a little bit different, that's why. The year is 2014, and Destiny is a brand new game hitting the shelves for the first time. You can explore Mars, you can explore the Moon, Venus, and even our own Earth. Well, Russia, but still Earth. Equipped with you on this adventure is a ghost from that giant ping pong ball in the sky, and that very first weapon you pick up the Kvostov. We know that the Traveler made the ghosts, but we don't always know who made the weapons in Destiny. We always find ourselves talking about how Destiny has the best gunplay of any first-person shooter, and we have talked about some of the best exotics in the game, with more stories to come. But we also never talk about the foundries that make these weapons happen. A foundry is simply the manufacturers of the weapons we all enjoy in the game. And you'd be surprised with how many there truly are, and even more surprised with how many we don't even know about. Destiny 2 alone has 751 legendary weapons, and 95 exotic weapons. So, someone has to be making all these weapons happen. I went down a rabbit hole these past couple of months, and I've discovered things about Destiny weapon foundries I don't think anyone was supposed to know. But I have gathered what I think is every single weapon foundry that we know about in Destiny and put it together in this video. This was such a wild roller coaster, and I'm so happy to share all of these hidden gems with you. Some with an amazing history filled with good, and others downright corporate espionage. So before the Big B catches me for sharing this information, I have one simple rule. If you learn something new today, be sure to drop me a like and a subscription. YouTube Analytics says that not a lot of you are doing that, and it's two clicks and you can always unsub later if you want to. Now, I believe it's time to jump straight to Weapon Foundries in Destiny, the biggest secret the game has been keeping right in front of your face this whole time. Now for a special message from our other foundry. The foundry no man watching this video is really paying attention to, but you definitely should be. The skin foundry, geology. Guys, we just do a little splash of water to the face or the old shower down method. But let's be real, it ain't working anymore. Geology is the foundry with the solution. There's not the 50 magic potions your partner is doing here to make themselves 20 years younger. This is simple, and you can skip about 47 of the 50 potions with a 9-time award-winning, 5,005-star reviewed, easy exotic skincare for men. Listen, we game all day, we game all night, and you're probably watching this in bed on your phone before you fall asleep, right? Solution is Geology's eye cream. I've been using it for a hot minute, and it's really nice to be ridding myself of the dark circles under my eyes. It's not alone, either as they have the face wash and face cream to assist this foundry. Well, Sigma Chad told me to tell you to head to geology.com and take their free skincare quiz to save up to 50% on your 30-day trial. Even better, join their new Geology Galaxy community for more daily tips, giveaways, and more at the link posted down below. 
at discord.gg geology. Thank you to Geology for sponsoring today's video, and now it's time for the next foundry. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video, as well as the music too. The first weapon foundry up is the Foundry of the People. Meet Hake. Hake is a weapon manufacturer in Destiny that has a solid design philosophy. Hammers, not scalpels. Relatable design harkening back to a lost era. Hake is not about exciting form, it's about exciting function. A weapon's weapon. Hake is the instrument of the people. Hake being the foundry of the everyday person is so fitting, since the Hake emblem was involved in the Trials win trading scandal that we covered in another video. And maybe now it makes sense? Hake weapons feature hexagonal designs and tan surfaces with orange stripes. Hake weapons are simple, reliable, and focus on offense. Perks are unlocked first, with stat modifiers as the last upgrades. They are frequently high impact, low rate of fire kinetic weapons that have better accuracy and recoil when they're aimed and stationary, in sharp contrast to the high mobility weapons of other manufacturers. Hake weapons are typically named after a famous ruler or warrior, followed by a letter. An example would be the Galahad E. This foundry isn't without its own story either, as over three years after the tower blew up in the Red War, city investigator V. Meyer found out Hake had scooped up a piece of the Traveler's Cage and kept it in their armory for... reasons? The technology was then stolen by three scions of Keitel's forces in order to research Gaul's light trapping technology. Getting back to some of Hake's more notorious weapons, there's the Stillpiercer. There's the Antiope D, the Apple of Discord, the Halfdan D, the Long Shadow, and most recently, the new Guardian Games SMG, the title. Hake has one exotic in Destiny 1, and only for Titans, named the Fabian Strategy, but no exotics that we know of in Destiny 2. According to Bungie, Hake is officially pronounced Haka, though Cable pronounced it as Hake, during the Cade Stash mission. NPCs in the new tower will sometimes also pronounce it as Hake as well. Hake weapons bear a close resemblance to modern day weaponry as part of their emphasis on function over form. Hake not only was for the people, but for the story too, as now Keitel's betrayers can thank this foundry for keeping some cabal our enemies. I know that's not all the weapons of Hake, but this video would get really long if we pointed out all of them and for other foundries too. So if you at any point notice a weapon that stood out that I didn't cover, or one that I did cover, be sure to drop me a comment on your favorite one or the most important one that we missed. Thank you. Datto. Datto. Nope, it's not Datto, but Dido are another weapon foundry in Destiny. Dido may have originally been established during the Golden Age, as evidenced by the dilapidated billboards bearing the company logo in the Buried City area of Mars or in the Shattered Coast on Venus. We also saw them in the world event for the Season of Arrivals on the streets of the Last City in the Riverside District. There's also a secret room in the Tower for Dido that was never used except to run through for lore and the Leviathan's Breath. But maybe one day we'll use it? Dido weapons follow a naming scheme where the name of a city is followed by two-letter designation code, sometimes an abbreviation of the weapon type followed by a number as well. An example would be the Saigon LR5. Several Dido products bear the symbol of the Jade Rabbit, which includes the two-tailed fox, the Moonfang armor, and the Jade Rabbit itself being a few examples. Dido is, and always will be to me, a designer brand more than just a weapon foundry. I like to look at them as the Gucci of Destiny gear. What's odd about the secret room in Destiny 2 is that a journal of Anna Bray was found in there. It's unclear what the purpose this room really had, maybe it was like early Destiny 2 design for something, or whether there was any connection between this and the Bray family, but maybe since Banshee stored the Leviathan's breath on a journey through here, this was like a Bray shop? Now, putting that aside, on the Gemini Jester, the symbols of both the Jade Rabbit and Clovis Bray can be seen, which may be another hint of their past cooperation. 
According to the lore of the Jade Rabbit, Dido are the creators of an item named Lunal. It's currently unknown what Lunal is as it doesn't appear in-game or mentioned anywhere else in Destiny, but it's there. The Jade Rabbit has a history of its own that is probably one of the best moments in gaming I can think of with the fate of all fools. And it happens to be the highest viewed video on my channel for a reason. Dido may look designer, but a lot of their weapons are common or uncommon, meaning they don't have a lot of endgame staying power. I'd really like to see more legendaries and exotics from this foundry since they just look really sweet, but they're just missing that last piece. Thanks, Dado. Just when you thought we weren't going to talk about Suros, we're talking about Suros. We can't have a weapon foundry list without our boy who started the whole damn regime, right? We all take aim and fire our Suros regime, but I'm not sure you knew about our Suros delirium. Our Suros first in, last out. Our Suros... Yeah, you get the point. Throughout the history of Destiny, we have been firing these guns. But what do we know about the Suros manufacturer? Almost nothing. Suros gives Guardians the most stat customization options of any weapon, making them flexible for all combat scenarios. Suros weapons also tend to favor good handling and offer the most sight mods of any foundry. Don't believe me? Just check in the game. Suros weapons feature curved surfaces and sleek red and white designs. Suros weapons formerly had Suros in the name, followed by three letters and two numbers. But as of Destiny 2, Suros naming conventions have become a little bit more creative, using musical terms followed by a two-digit number. A good example in Destiny 2 would be the Harmony 21, the Galliard 42, the Requiem 43, and so on. Suros weapons are one of three foundries featured in Arms Day in Destiny 1 as well. Something that I wish returned to Destiny 2 to give us something extra to chase. Oh god, I'm getting sentimental about Destiny 1 again. And it gave us a reason to log on on Wednesdays. I couldn't sum up the design philosophy of Suros any better than this. Suros is elegance amidst brutality. Oh boy! Look at what we have here. Is this a super soaker? Nope, it's an Omelon weapon. Omelon is another foundry much like Suros. It has been around Destiny since the beginning of its time and has some distinct characteristics to it unlike any other. It feels like I stepped into Aperture Labs with Omelon weapons. I'm the man who's gonna burn your house down with the lemons. And you know what? I think I'd let my body be used for Omelon weapon science one day. So what's the deal with them? Omelon is a pioneer of energy weapons, with an emphasis on good handling and behavioral perks over stat modifications. Omelon weapons were black in Destiny 1, and are now aqua in Destiny 2. Omelon weapons follow a naming scheme where an abyssal or chthonic entity is followed by the initials of the weapons class, and a number. That may be Lovecraftian, but what isn't is the invention of the Trace Rifle, which Omelon is directly responsible for. The design philosophy of Omelon is experimental, bordering on irresponsible, powered by barely understood technology, a fusion of the mad scientist and a product engineer of the new frontier. A staple to these guns is the hallmark liquid ammo displayed on the side to make it look like a super soaker being named Omelon with its power cells. Some of their most notorious weapons include the Hung Jury, the Irene RR4, or from the Wrath of the Machine raid, the Ex Machina, the Chaos Dogma, the Last Hope sidearm from Destiny 2, the Crucible Infinite Range Nightmare Aryan Till, the Callus Buster 9000 Cold Heart, and that, uh, that funky weapon, Hard Light. The list just goes on and on, and I think these have to be the most satisfying sounding weapons out there too. Always feeling nice to click heads with. I just really like Omelon. According to Tower NPC Dialogue, Omelon does most of its business with warlocks too. I guess because of uh, space magic? Omelon is also tied for the second most exotics to a foundry, with one we will be getting to in first place. Overall, Omelon is the future returned. 
Me text Maki. I mean mechanic. I mean Machina. I mean Mechanica. The foundry I can never say properly. I always find myself saying Machina and not Mechanica, so you know this Rona I'm trying to kick right now is clogging my brain. This is also my personal favorite weapon foundry in Destiny. Tex is a weapon foundry from the last city who develops weapons in the style of the Wild West. It is one of the city's oldest weapon foundries and believed to have been around when the city walls were in construction. During the early city age, Tex Mechanica had the mindset that was widely accepted at the time. Survival of the fittest, something Lord Saladin would shamelessly steal in Season of the Risen. They made some of the most badass weapons for Guardians to use, and would continue for years to come. Tex weapons are more niche in the space, but they prioritize quality over quantity. Some of our most beloved weapons like Dead Man's Tail, The Last Word, The Chaperone, First Curse, Huckleberry, and The Prospector are from them. This is also the most exotic heavy foundry there is. They have very few non-exotic weapons, but there may be a reason for that, as the Drifter notes that Tex Mechanica weapons are the most similar to the Dark Age weapons out of all currently produced weaponry. The most recent legendary Tex weapon isn't even really from Destiny, with the Wastelander M5. Tex isn't without its bad history though, as they attempted to bribe Lord Shax into fixing Crucible matches, just to make their weapons look good. But Shax threatened them with sending a squad of Titans into their factory at the suggestion. And I don't know if you've seen Titans this season, but holy shit, you don't want that to happen. To smooth things out, they shipped Shax free weapons. They also accepted a substantial bribe from the player in return for getting into the next phase of their shotgun contest. The Crucible Quartermaster Tex 9940 is a part of this group of space cowboys. So I'm just going to assume they're all aliens from the planet Texas. I'm really hoping we learn more about Tex and their amazing arsenal of weapons. I would take a whole season with just these weapons being the focus. These weapons will put some poison on any Destiny player's fingers. Better than uh, Cheeto dust, I guess. These are viced weapons. And yeah, you've definitely shot a lot of them. Viced weapon philosophy is in direct opposition to our friends at Hake. Vice specializes in all-purpose, highly advanced weapons for Guardians, and they were brand new to Destiny in Destiny 2. The majority of Vice weapons are fast-firing and quick-handling, with a balancing set of perks and a unique appearance that sets it apart from other foundries. Vice weapons are designed and named to evoke venomous creatures, and each one includes an onboard AI programmed with the killer instincts of its host weapon's namesake. This philosophy was inspired by the death of a man from a snakebite by the Northern City Wall. Vice weapons are noted to have a distinct, futuristic visual style. I mean, whatever that means, since Destiny's already in the future. Many include bladed projections on the trigger guard or elsewhere, giving them an aggressive appearance. Vice weapons also use some side-loading magazine wells, as opposed to the bottom-loading magazine wells used on most weapons. Their weapons include Recluse, or the most recent Recluse, Funnel Web, the Exotic Grenade Launcher Colony, the Arsenic Bite Bow, the Tarantula Linear Fusion Rifle, the Velakadin, the Quick Fang, and way, way more. There isn't much else known about Vice. But one thing is that they were one of the only companies to manufacture linear fusion rifles for a long time, outside of Sleeper Simulant. Other than that, they're just a solid weapon manufacturer focused on fast, agile, and powerful weapons. I think aside from loving using their guns, I just like how they sound. And the names are pretty badass too. Cheeto Dust Off, Vice Weapons On. These are the strongest weapons ever introduced to Destiny, and they most definitely have a foundry worthy of the best season, yeah I said it, in Destiny history. Meet the Black Armory. Now the Black Armory has some notoriously overpowered weapons, like the Kindled Orchid that could get Rampage and Kill Clip, Blast Furnace with Rampage and Feeding Frenzy, 
when Feeding Frenzy gave Max Reload for a single kill, no matter where. Oh, should we also talk about the fact that old Rampage at times three was a 60% damage buff? And that the Black Armory season introduced Rampage spec for longer lasting Rampage. The Black Armory also had Hammerhead, which was the best legendary machine gun in Destiny 2 for a while. And the first legendary machine gun in Destiny 2 outside of Avalanche. But nobody really talks about Avalanche, like come on. Threat level, which was the best legendary shotgun in a shotgun meta, keep in mind. These weapons were all insane, and there's more legendaries to go over, but I think that just takes away from the Black Armory exotics, which are still some of the best in Destiny 2. Exotics like Lu Monarch, or uh, just Monarch, and its special purple poison, making it not a weapon of sorrow, just a weapon of making me want to punch the screen. Jotun, and not the actual toaster, which almost burned down my house on the lowest toaster settings. I'm serious, by the way, there was even like a Jotun symbol burnt into the middle. And Izanagi's Burden, probably my favorite exotic Destiny 2 ever introduced. The Black Armory may not be the creators of this next one, but since it came out in this DLC, I'm gonna throw it in there too. Anarchy, which came out in the Scourge of the Past DLC, also was a part of these exotics. Y'all are gonna hate me even more than the Tex Mechanica or Machina pronunciation with, with these names. The Black Armory was founded at the end of the Golden Age by three families. The French House of Meirin, the Norse Rasmussen clan, and the Japanese Setau tribe each bringing elements of their native heritage to the armory's design. The clan's matriarchs Henriette Mayrin, Helga Rasmussen, and Yuki Setau believed that the Earth was about to be invaded by some extraterrestrial enemy and agreed to manufacture and stockpile advanced firearms to ensure the survival of their families. They built several forges that we saw in the game in Black Armory, and were selling some weapons to compensate for their expenses. Helga Rasmussen, previously of Clovis Bray, ran the business side of things. And it's sort of similar to another foundry we will get to, but these weapons were made out of sort of an end-world protocol. The armory's precautions failed, and when the actual collapse started, their superior firearms provided little protection against the darkness onslaught. After one of the attacks by some monstrous minion of the darkness, the group had to abandon their hideout and leave their forges behind. Henriette's daughter, Adelaide, was severely injured in the attack, and Henriette reluctantly agreed to Yuki's proposal to upload Adelaide's conscious to an experimental exo-body, thus creating our favorite transmog robot, Ada-1. Just don't look her up with a 34 at the end. Ada-1 served as a mobile forge, being able to create and upgrade Black Armory weapons with her bare hands. Unfortunately, unique weapons produced by Ada-1 turned out to be the group's bane in the post-collapse world, as they attracted multiple bandits and robbers, including some risen proto-warlords. Man, that sounds like the most gamer sentence I have ever said. Eventually, every other member of the group perished with only Ada-1 remaining. She ended up hiding in the last city, remaining secretive and distrustful of any light bearers, even the Guardians. You can see her story finally playing out at the end of the Black Armory with Niobe Labs. The Black Armory proves that it's not just the gut-punching weapons, it's the heart-ripping stories that go with them. Speaking of that other foundry, we have Ikelos, the weapons of Future's Past and Rasputin's backup. Ikelos, or Braytech, is the weapon foundry that Clovis Bray doesn't want you to know about. I have a weird thing for these weapons, especially since we know them to have so many different names, but they were made under the same makers. Weapons like the Sleeper Simulant, the Polaris Lance, Telesto's Grandpappy named Pocket Infinity, and anything with Ikelos in the name, I would put under this. And even though it's technically SIVA, I'm still putting it on there, Rasputin still did have his hands in it. So Outbreak, you're here too. Ikelos weapons specifically released in the Warmind expansion, and are a part of the Ikelos Protocol, which is meant to provide Guardians with weapons to fight the darkness. According to the classical poet Ovid, the Greek god Ikelos is the son of Morpheus, 
yes, from the Matrix, and is himself the god of nightmares, meaning that these cyberpunk weapons are also the weapons of nightmares, something Shadowkeep would shamelessly steal two years later. Ikelos legendary weapons can be differentiated by the initials between the Ikelos title and the version number. The SMG uh, standing for submachine gun. That's that's pretty obvious. Based on the sleeper simulants grimoire cards from the Taken King and Warmind, it can be inferred that Rasputin's Operation Midnight Exigent is preventing him from deploying his total arsenal to fully defend himself and the system. So he must utilize the Guardians as a sort of proxy through the Ikelos Protocol. It makes me wonder if this is only a taste of the full arsenal Rasputin could give us, and if there's some serious exotics left for Destiny players to put the smackdown on the witness with. Another fun fact about Ikelos weapons themselves is that aside from being rare and best in class for a while, having Warmind cell mods work with them, and just looking fantastic, it's that they were side products of Year 1 of Destiny 2. These weapons could have their element changed from Arc to Solar and Void and so on. Oh, also, the shotgun absolutely slapped and was a part of Destiny 2's best loadout for a while, the Midnight Coup, Ikelos SG, Whisper of the Worm tandem. Maybe we'll get a Rasputin season again. Okay, better than that one. From the glory of Ikelos and Braytech to the Curse of Osiris and the Infinite Forge. You remember these guns, right? Or did I just unlock a deep-seated memory you never wanted to have again? Welcome back to the Infinite Forge. This is more of a stretch to call it a foundry, but it technically is, so let's talk about it. Some of these weapons you may be familiar with, like the Jack Queen King 3, which was brought back in Season of Dawn and Sunset again. The Soul Pariah 6 and the Perfect Paradox, which is Saint 14 shotgun, and the final weapon from upgrading the forge. The Infinite Forge, before the sun set, was an impromptu weapon foundry located on Mercury. Situated in the lighthouse and overseen by the followers of Osiris, aka Brother Vance's room, the forge specialized in co-opting Vex technology to guardian weaponry. I always loved this room since it was the lighthouse from Destiny 1, and I always wanted Mercury in Destiny 1 for this reason. Destiny 1 always just seems so larger than life. With 11 weapons in total to create and obtain, each of which could be acquired after completing the designated Prophecy Tablet, which was fulfilled by seeking out the required resources around the solar system, and by seeking resources, I mean hours and hours of public events. For one piece of material, then you turn it in for the rep, you level it up, and you grab a weapon. Yeah, that was a hassle, and not a fun one at that. One cool note here is that the Machina Day 4 bears resemblance to the Stranger's Rifle and the No Time to Explain. There is no explanation offered for the resemblance, but I mean, they did both travel through time using Vex tech, so maybe they slapped Finn on the way through. This weapon foundry wasn't without a cool reward for getting all the weapons, however, because after forging all of them, you got Segura's Shell before Segura got hit with the nine. Oh, also the Telesto Catalyst, but I'm not trying to have my vi- These are the weapons you definitely forgot about. I know, I know, we have all seen them, and some of them are classics to Destiny, but I never knew this was the foundry making them. Meet Cassoid a weapon foundry of the city, and not much else is known about them. Just your typical clean slate foundry. Banshee44 is a client, so Clovis knows what's good. Cassoid weapons are known for, quote, being very good, but don't let it get to their heads. The naming scheme on these weapons is typically two Latin words followed by a Roman numeral. An example would be the Nox Cantor 5. Other than that, we know nothing about them. Some of the weapons you have heard of include Dead Messenger, Ariana's Vow, The Invective, and What is Happening, and oh, God! Ah. Subscribe to this channel now and use code EVAN at GAMERSUBS for 10% off your order. Or be cursed with this weapon clapping your cheeks for 15 years. 
Yeah, that was odd. A lot of these weapons get passed up because they're pretty basic blues and greens, but they do have some gems among the coals. I think Cassoid is just a foundry we all collectively just go, yeah, that's a gun, and we're not really interested in their story. Just the average Joes of Destiny. What you probably didn't know about Galahorn is that it not only broke the internet, it also has a foundry of other powerful names behind it. Meet Crux and Lamar, a weapon foundry of the city formerly based out of Bannerfall. Founded by weaponsmiths Faisal Crux and Victor Lamar, the Foundry is the creator of the Galahorn. They're the creator of the Truth and the creator of Dragon's Breath. Oh, you know, just the most busted PvP rocket with its absurd tracking in Destiny 1. The most powerful exotic in all of Destiny 1 and most of Destiny 2 now that it's been here. And the funky rocket that makes fire go all around. Crux and Lamar rocket launchers names use a royal or noble title followed by a two-letter alpha code. An example would be the Painted Camelot SA-4. Not a lot may be known about this foundry, but I will say they had a kick-ass quest in the Rise of Iron expansion to get the Iron Galahorn back. I only wish there was a SIVA-filled rocket to shoot too. Maybe with a Wrath of the Machine remake and Outbreak already being in the game, we can get a SIVA rocket? Ah, they only make rocket launchers, but that doesn't mean they don't have some of the best legendary ones in Destiny either. Some other notable ones are the Heezen's Vengeance and the Hothead, both of which have been fan favorites and best in class legendary rockets. Something about this foundry just tells me it's like the mom pop shop of the foundries, since they only make rockets and it makes me appreciate them a little bit more. Why am I sentimental about a foundry of fictional characters we've never seen before in Destiny? What what's wrong with me? What has COVID done to my brain? Okay, I know you forgot about this foundry. Meet Nadir, a foundry with very little known about them. With weapons that follow a naming scheme of a scientific term followed by a three-letter alpha code. An example being the Impulse ESC. This faction doesn't have a lot of heavy hitters, with a lot of blue and green weapons to their name but they do have one exotic that you also probably forgot about. Do you remember Nemesis Star? No, no, me either, me, me either. Even the weapons Grimoire jokes about not knowing this foundry, so don't feel bad for forgetting. Quote, who or what is the weapon foundry known as Nadir? Where did it come from? And is the foundry's name a commentary on its own quality or that of its rivals? An expression of fatalism? An inside joke? Nadir may be the most down-to-earth of the factions, seeing as they joke about themselves. But the point remains, this faction is unknown to almost everyone. The term Nadir is most commonly used in the Astro Navigation to refer to the opposite of the zenith, which is the highest point in the sky that an object will reach. Nadir, then, describes the lowest point in the sky an object will reach. The closest answer we have to them may be in that Grimoire card. That what is the answer when the question is extinction? This leads me to believe that this foundry was making some doo-doo weapons and gave up on their dreams of making some badass guns. Don't give up on your dreams, YouTube. You never know when something you like to play turns into a video game, breaking down the niche portions of that said game. Oh, you're still here? Well, then you get to learn about the weirdest space mafia that is actually one giant easter egg to Marathon, Mida. Strap your tinfoil hats on for this one. Mida, or, well, we don't know the acronym, was a rebel group that seized control of Mars. During its brief reign, Mida was responsible for the deaths of 10%, holy fuck, of the Martian population, dude, 10%. Jesus Christ. The government eventually fell, and its surviving loyalists were forced to go on the run from threats, such as the Battleroids. Mida, like we said before, is actually one giant reference to Marathon and its timeline, specifically the Rose Level, where the history of the Mida is discussed. The terminal entry is read, quote, The Mida crew was afterwards criticized for its short-sightedness. 
In an organization that was notorious for its long-ranging policies and politicking, the coup was very short-lived. Maida never seriously accounted for the UEG's overwhelming superiority in ground forces and warship. In fact, they never attempted to take over the Marathon, which was nearing completion and would have made a very powerful weapon. The Marathon's massive size made it invulnerable to most normal space attacks, and it would have made a very stable weapons platform. After the failed coup, the leaders of Maida were executed for their crimes, and the political organization was banned in all forms. I will let you do a read of all the connections players have found, but it's cool to know a space terrorist government are a crossover into the Destiny universe with these weapons. Oh, the weapons, that's, that's right. Well, we have the Mita Multi-Tool and the Mita Mini-Tool. I guess the Callus Mini-Tool too, but that's neither here nor there. Shax even came up with his own interpretation for Mita, saying that it's, quote, Mars is damnably arid. Thanks, Shax. The final foundry we know of, which isn't really a foundry, but this is my video, so you're gonna have to deal with it, is the Weapons of Sorrow. These are the weapons from a collection of infamous Guardian weapons that have been acquired and modified by the Hive using their arcane science and magic. They are associated with tragedy and destruction, as they seem to inevitably corrupt the Guardians that wield them and drive them to commit heinous acts of violence and cruelty. Most of these weapons were believed to have been destroyed. There are only three confirmed weapons of sorrow, the hand cannon known as Thorn, the auto rifle known as Necrochasm, and the submachine gun known as Osteostriga. Various other weapons bear some of the hallmarks of the Weapons of Sorrow, but are not confirmed to be a part of this class. These include the Pulse Rifle Bad Juju, the Scout Rifle Touch of Malice, the Sniper Rifle Whisper of the Worm, and the Hand Cannon Malfeasance. The Hive Acolyte, named Ankar, the Anointed, that sounds like a Yu-Gi-Oh card. <laughs> Dude, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Is known to be a craftsman of one or more Weapons of Sorrow. Enkar himself wields a weapon referred to as Proto-Thorn, which may or may not itself be a weapon of sorrow. Let's be real, it probably is. And with that being said, those are the Foundries of Destiny. The Foundries of Destiny may be something so universal to the game that we never stop to pay attention to them. There's something equally empty as there is equally full learning about the creators of our favorite guns. We still don't have a home for more than half of them, but for those we do know about, I have hopefully shed some light or newfound love and appreciation for the characteristics of your favorite weapons. Over time in Destiny, a lot has been discovered, but these weapon stories, I feel, have been hidden for quite some time. Thank you for watching this video as it's something a bit different for the channel. I hope that it's something that sticks, but just know that these smaller stories can also be found on my second YouTube channel and on TikTok as well. Sometimes the smaller stories of Destiny don't work for the main channel, but when this many stories about foundries exist, I figure it's time for me to step in and add them to a long list for the main channel. Anyways, Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Use code Evan at Gamersubs. Watch my stream since I'm there every single day, and I'll see you next time.